Hello, and welcome to our video audio podcast, Couched in Color. I'm your mental health expert, teen and young adult crusader, and psychological scientist, Dr. Alfie. This podcast reflects my life's work, helping our young people and young at heart identify mental health challenges, disrupt negative patterns, and discover the best versions of themselves. I'm so happy that you've joined us. For over 20 years, I want you to know that I've had my finger on the pulse of BIPOC teen mental health. I recognize that historically and currently with these dual pandemics of COVID and racial injustice raging, our young people are suffering, sometimes they're struggling, and always the care that they need is quite scarce. So each week I'm joined by young people, mental health experts, celebrities, and influencers to help us uncover the secrets to healing the hearts and minds of our BIPOC teens, their families, and their communities. Here at Couched in Color, we believe deeply in spreading love and light bolstered by culturally relevant science. So let's dive in. Welcome to Couched in Color, everybody. It is my honor. I'm always honored to have every guest who chooses to share time with me and every guest is unique in what they bring to this experience and to this conversation. And I just wanna make sure that I am thoroughly honoring uh, today, who uh, you're going to hear about shortly. His name is Dr. Russell Lede. Get it right, y'all. It ain't Lede. Lede. Uh, my French is horrible, but uh, we're going to try to use it. I need y'all to hear all of Dr. Lede's credentials, right? Because I love bigging up my black and brown folks who out here, you know, everybody deserves their they flowers, but my homie right here, good Lord. So you need to hear about these credentials. So Dr. Lede, if you would please introduce yourself to the peoples and tell us a little bit about you. And then we're going to get into this whole conversation about mental health. Now, let me say before you start, some people are already going to know who you are. So for those of you who already know who this superstar is, we're sorry for being redundant. But for them people who've been under a rock for like the past year and don't know who he is, you finna know. So Dr. Lede, that beautiful yeah. smile, the floor is yours. Please introduce yourself to the people. Yeah, so my name is Dr. Russell Liday. Um, currently, I'm a third year medical student and business student at, at Tulane University School of Medicine. Um, prior to this, I was in the military for nearly 10 years, both as a ceremonial guardsman and then in cryptology intelligence. And then I also went to NYU School of Medicine and, um, and went and got a PhD in molecular oncology and tumor immunology. Uh, and that work was funded by some really important people like the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, the Ford Foundation, National Institute of Health. And then my work was published in Nature twice in one year. So <laughs> um, <laughs> I think I've uh, I've done some pretty cool stuff in my lifetime. Woo, now so for the and people who, there you go. Don't forget the daddy part. I seen them cute babies. Right. And a spouse. Don't forget that that spouse, that spouse down there holding it down. So, yes. So I want you all to hear like I just want to like put it in just a little tiny bit of context to get published in nature in medicine. If you're in the field of medicine um, is a big deal. A lot of black folks, I'm going to be honest, never get published in nature. Uh, they have a whole career and it never happens. So to have someone on here who early in his career you know, early in this career, right? He's had other careers, but early in this academic medicine career is what we call it. To have two publications in Nature is a really big deal. And I think it speaks to the arc of how far we have come as a people, Black people in particular, uh, Black doctors, Black folks in medicine, because it ain't nothing nice, right? These, these academic streets, I say it all the time, they real, right? The struggle is real in academic medicine. So just, I just want to like really lift that up. And then the other thing I wanna lift up is that he's already Dr. Lede. He's a doctor, he's a PhD, right? Which of course is near and dear to my heart. But he also is in the process of becoming another doctor, an MD, a medical doctor. So those things are really important. And you all, everybody who knows me knows how important research and science is to me. So to have a, he said tumor, what did you say, tumor what? Immunology, that's not what you said. Yeah, tumor immunology and molecular oncology. You did say tumor immunology. See, I didn't trust myself. So with tumor immunology and molecular what? Oncology. There you go. Molecular oncology, right? So y'all know that has to do with the study of cancer. Um, when you talk about oncology um, and everybody knows what tumors are. So to have, right, representation matters, right? And so the, the fact that we're going to have this brother fighting for us on our behalf is like wonderful to me. But we're not going to talk about 
all of that necessarily. What we really want to talk about is mental health. So I would love to hear Dr. Lede, and you have to forgive me for being formal. I'm going to be like my grandma, God rest her soul. Once I got my doctorate, my name stopped being Alfie. It was doctor this, doctor that, doctor. My grandbaby is a doctor, doctor that. So we're going to do you the same way. Um, so Dr. Lede, tell us a little bit about, um, I really want to hear about this, the white coats. Tell us about the white coats and then like lead us into a conversation about mental health and medicine for black men um, and for you and for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the 15 white coats, uh, where do I start? The 15 white coats was founded uh, from a conversation that I had with a young child. Um, my oldest child at the time was eight years old, J June or July of 2019. And so one of my best friends, he and I, he went to an HBCU. I went to an HBCU. He came down to visit me. Um, we were in the same lab getting our PhD. So you can only imagine what that vibe was like. Um, and that, that was really where Black men and mental health was like a thing for us. Um, we prayed for each other, talked to each other. And he came down to visit me. So he took a break from his PhD and came down to visit me for a week. And um, obviously, when you go to HBCUs, they make sure that at the front of your brain is black history. It's like a thing for you. Like it's not just something that you think about only in February, but it's something that at every turn you try to evaluate where does black history play a role and what's going on. Amen. And so um, we had a conversation about visiting the plantation because we had read up on it and, and the, the way that that plantation operates is very different from probably any other plantation in the mm. United States um, because it, it focuses on the lives of the enslaved as That's a focus right. to um, the terrorists. Definitely. So, um, that's what I really loved about it. And my daughter at the time, who's, who's a tennis player, she, she was supposed to be at tennis camp that day. But as a parent, you know, when you look for, you look for opportunities to put them in positions to understand that at some point later, when they have a little bit better understanding of life, um, they understand why you took them there. So I sort of volunteered her, she had to come. Mm -hmm. And thank God that I did because we went there in that exact same uh, enslaved quarter that we stood in front of to take those photos, she walked into. Now, prior to her walking into there, she was very disinterested. She was doing what eight-year-olds do in the summertime when they want to be somewhere else. They're like, I don't want to be here. Mm -hmm. I got things I want to be doing. I want to be playing tennis with my friends and this and that. But then she walked in and she saw this bed. And the bed, the bottom of the bed had strings. And so they would put hay on top of strings. And that was essentially their box mattress and their mattress for them to sleep on. So she was like, dad, how can anyone like live in this? How, like, how is this a thing? And I, you know, of course, trying to hold back tears. I was like, Malia, like, you know, it, it was like, we had a time when things were rough. And so she just kind of wandered off on her own and she came back with some tears in her eyes and she just was so mad. And I was like, I'm happy you mad right now because it means that you're starting to understand the weight of the yes. moon. Yes. And the rest of the time we walked around for the tour, she just was in her own world. She was much more attentive. And then when we left, because it's like 45 minutes outside of New Orleans, she, uh, she stopped me in the middle of a conversation uh, Philip and I were having. And she was like, dad. I was like, what's up, Malia? And she was like, now I understand why it's such a big deal to be a Black doctor in America. It's an eight-year-old telling me this. And I'm just like, oh, all right, well, explain to me what you know. You know, and she was like, well, Dad, just think about it. We just left a plantation. She was like, and when we were there, we were nothing but, like, property. We were property. They could tell us where to go, when to go, what to do, whether or not we could read, and this and that. She was like, but it's not like that anymore. She was like, I'm riding in the car with two black doctors. She was like, that's a big deal, right? She was like, did I get it right? And I was like, you got it right. You got it. I was like, you got it. You got it. And of course, Philip was like, man, bro, she, she didn't hit the nail on the head. Yes. I turned over to Philip and I was like, bro, I got an idea. I was like, I think we could show the whole world how far black people have come. So I came back, talked to some medical school classmates. And some were down for the cause. Um, you know, I, I can understand why some people were hesitant. 
because it's a provocative photo to take. It's, it's a provocative thing to do. And some people not at a place where having a conversation about, you know, ancestral knowledge and just like the history is just, it's uncomfortable for them. I went to an HBCU where you were forced to do it. So, you know, with that being the case, it, it was kind of like very comfortable for me. And yeah. so, you know, for those people who were down for the cause, we got together and I told them in an email, in the invite to everyone, I said, listen, we're going to go take these photos in these white coats in all black and um, it's going to be iconic. And uh, can we edit? Can we yeah. edit? All right. Yes. Yeah. Do what you got to do. Go ahead. We were having this moment um, and I told him in this email, I was just like, listen, this is going to be iconic. Yep. You're going to take these photos and they'll be iconic. I was like, we have to let people, I think the subject says something to the, the, the lens of we have to remind ourselves how far we've come. Amen. Because oftentimes we worry about how many stumbling blocks we still have in front of us. Right. And, and we haven't, like, we haven't reflected enough on you know, just like the church said, the resilience that we come from, the ancestral lineage we come Amen. from, the hell we've been through. Amen. And, and who you looking at now is a product of that, that resilience. And so you're not looking at no, you know, no, 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 uh, no whoop bag. You're looking at somebody who's got a lot. And sometimes we got to tap into that to get you more. Amen. So we did that. We took those photos. We posted them on social media. And they did what we expected them to do. You know, they got a lot of notoriety. And we took the moment to say, let's honor our ancestors and not just use this as a clout moment. And let's use this to do something that they would be proud of. So we started a company, um, <clears throat> which is turning into a nonprofit now. And essentially the whole idea behind it is, is that instead of us waiting for somebody else to fund getting black people into medical school, we're gonna do it ourselves. Amen. So that's what we at with it right now. And obviously we've taken a photo and our goal is to take that photo and put it in 100,000 learning spaces around the country. Uh, I get bounce around the globe because it's in Zimbabwe, it's in Wales, um, it's in Europe, it's in South America, it's in a lot of places, <laughs> it's in Canada. So, uh, you know, what our initial idea, which was 10,000 posters is now at like 100,000. I think at some point it'll be a million. Wow. I love it. So do you all sell? So it's a poster and you sell it? Yeah. So you can buy it. There, you can buy shirts, there's hoodies, there's and and 100 percent of the profits go to doing this work. None of us take any money home. Zero. Wow. Not one dollar. Yes. yes. Um, one because like at the end of the day, right? All 15 of us are gonna be physicians. I don't yes. think we're gonna be struggling for money. Right. So we should be able to take this money and put it directly towards the cause. Oh. That's legitimately gonna push our people forward. I mean, our health disparities. It, I always say that we don't need more black people in medicine. We need more black people in medicine who are worried about black people. Mm. Amen. That's a whole different, that's a whole different conversation. Because mm. you got some black people honestly going into medicine who worried about how much money they make. And I don't <laughs> have no problem with you having an economic, you know, right. up, but you also need to worry about black people. Yes. Yes, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. So I, I love the concept. I love the way it came about. That story that you shared about your daughter and her getting it reminds me, we made a trip when my kids were it was about seven years ago. So my kids were probably 10, eight and 10. And we took them to Williamsburg, which I have to be honest, I don't have a lot of affection for. I'm from Virginia, um, Southeastern Virginia, and Williamsburg has never been my thing. Like I have friends who are of color and they're like, oh my God, I'm obsessed with Williamsburg. And I'm like, why though? Like what? Like I have a really close girlfriend. She's not black, but she's of color. And I'm like, girl, why? So, you know, I just, I don't get it. But they have this feature, which my mom, God rest her soul, took us to when we were kids, when I was 10 years old. Is when it first started and it's called, it used to be called the other side. Now it's called the African-American experience at Williamsburg. And it's similar to what you described with the enslavement quarters. They take you and they show, it's like a two hour tour. And when I tell you, it was just, I think my family was the only black family on the tour. It was like, like 10, 12 white families. And this is all stuff that I grew up learning, right? All my family, like you, 
all of my family's HBCU grads. So this was like, like my dad went to Norfolk State, my mom went to Mississippi Valley State, like everybody, Tougaloo, all, you know, all of, I went to Howard. So all of it is ingrained in us. And so when it was a natural choice to go to an HBCU where they were going to dump more in, but I can remember my son who he might not even been eight, maybe he was like seven or six, had one of those collars that they used to put on black men that had the points, the arrows, mm -hmm. so nobody could get close to them, right? And he just held it up and he had that moment like your daughter, he held it up, it makes me tear. And he was like, mom, they did this. And I'm looking at this beautiful fat face baby with this thing and I'm thinking, but you know, back then they would have put that on you. Yeah. And just so the like, and so just it's mind blowing. And so I'm so deeply appreciative of what you all are doing. And I love this concept of it's not just about who goes into medicine or science or whatever these fields are to address health disparities. It's about what's your intention when you get in there. So, you know, my passion is mental health disparities. So can you talk with me a little bit about let's talk about academic medicine. Let's talk about what it means to be a medical student or, you know, in your case, you already have a doctorate, you're getting another one. Let's talk about what it means to be in that space, being physically who you are, right? Like a solid brother, right? With natural hair, right? I mean, they can't miss you and chocolate. So yeah. you, you remind me of my brother. I have a younger brother who's like your, your size and build and everything. He used to play football. What is that like? And how does that impact brothers and sisters, I would say, mental health, being in that medicine space and the white spaces. Let me say that part too. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And, and I honestly love this question because it's an opportunity for me to be bluntly honest. Yes. I look this way on purpose. Amen. Like, if I had to, if I honestly had to like make a choice and knew that it wasn't gonna make an impact, I probably would get a shorter haircut and I wouldn't have a long beard. Right. Um, but, it, but I do it on purpose because I know that it makes people uncomfortable. Oof. I know it does. Like, I, I, I'm not, you know, every time somebody's like, are you sure you're supposed to be here? And I'm like, you should go check. You should go check. Because I mean, the, the honest, but I will say this, to, to get back to your original question. Mm. I think in the first two years of medical school, and then I can speak to graduate school too, but sure. in medical school, those first two years is like, you got to make a choice. Am I going to assimilate to yep. what Jordy in my class wants me to yep. do? Yep. Yep. Or am I going to stick to my culture and be ostracized? Yep. I struggle a lot of people have. Yep. Obviously, with me doing this long before my first two years of medical school was over, I, I chose the latter. But I chose the latter for a very different reason. I have two children at home. They're going to hold me accountable for my history. And the decisions that I make when they're older, they gonna yes. say, "Dad, you remember when you made that foul decision?" Yes. Or, "Dad, you remember when you made that brave decision?" Yes. Um, and so I have to evaluate all those things. I know that that comes at a cost, um, but it's a cost I'm willing to pay because, right? Like I, I'm not being held up by who the current leaders are of any institution. I'm being held up by my ancestors' expectations. So if you think about it from that lens, it, it, it sort of settles you into what will my ancestors want? Ooh. And because they had to do something that was uncomfortable. Yes, they did. Allow me to be in the place I'm in right now. Amen. And if I'm not furthering what they've already done, I'm wasting time. Amen. And we all know God only give you so many days on planet. Amen. That's right. So, you know, so there's, so there's that, there's that. But tell me, tell me a little bit about the cost. I don't think people understand what you mean when you like, I know what you mean, being a woman with locks and a chocolate girl and always fighting for black folks in academic medicine. That's why I left. What, what give us some examples of what are the costs that you're speaking of when you make the choice to be unapologetic about who you are as a black person? Yeah, I think, I think your credibility is always in question, even when you prove it. In moments when you just sit back and you like, bruh, you like, no one knows who you are. You can like, go, go figure out who you talking to. And it's still like, nah, that ain't enough. Or you're not focused enough. Or, you know, why would you have any interest outside? I think the questioning is the cost that 
I know that questioning is really just a surrogate for what their real issue is, which is their validation of invalidating me. That's it. Like that's that's what that's what all that questioning really is. And I think that's like the biggest cost is the is the the conscientious invalidation of me constantly. Yes. That's the part that I think I have to I have to wrestle with the most the most. And then I think the other thing is too is that I, I have to come up with a justification for why I'm willing to do all this and be left out of conversations. Yes. Because I know that inevitably there are going to be conversations for leadership positions. There are going to be conversations for um, upward mobility that is not going to take me into account because I don't look the part. I don't act mm. the part. I don't do what they want me to do. Mm. But I also realize like there are pioneers out there who've also made that decision and they're doing just fine. Amen. I want your money if it means my silence. Ooh, child. Yes. Yes. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Like, yes. if, if that's the trade-off, nah, I'm not interested in that. Yes. If, if I got to keep my job by shutting up, then I'm probably not going to keep this job. Amen. And I think I'm qualified enough to go get another one. So I think- <laughs> Amen. I love it. Preach, preach. <laughs> so that's the that's the first thing. And I, th- I think in graduate school, you yeah. have, it's a little bit different because like, I think there's much more intellectual dependence in graduate school. It's based on how many papers are you willing to read? There you go. How much data are you willing to analyze? That's right. How many conferences are you willing to go to? Yes, how many sir. presentations are you willing to go to? In science, how many hours are you willing to do experiments? Because no matter like what ethnicity you come from, you got to go get those experiments done. That's right. You know, and, 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 and that's the bottom line. And I think I, I'm not so naive that I know that I don't know that there are challenges to people who come from marginalized communities that conflict with being able to stay in that lab as long as people who don't have those extra that's right, you know, familial issues and my mom doesn't make that much money, but now I'm in graduate school and I'm making some money. So maybe I gotta send her some and yep. I gotta work a job while I'm getting a PhD because I gotta take care of the fact that you know, I have a family or this and that, which is much more common in our community than it is in other communities. And so I'm not that naive, but I know that at the end of the day, it it really comes down to how many experiments are you willing to do? How many papers are you willing to read? Um, how many conferences and how outward going you are? How many networks are you willing to build? How many people that you don't know have any clue about are you willing to reach out to and get resources from, especially in science? Yep. Um, um, and so it's about being bold, but part of being bold is, is being true to yourself. Amen. And one thing I want to put a pin on out of all that you said, the thing that we never talk about, not just me and you, is the systemic issues. Now you talked about it some, but in addition to all the work that you or I might have to do as a graduate student or a medical student is what work is the system doing to bring you into the fold? Because you can't just run and jump in somebody's lab. Somebody has to invite you into their lab. Or if you ask to be in their lab, they have to say yes. And once you get in the lab, they have to give you the plum assignments that are going to get you on the paper, that's going to get you to the presentation, that's going to, we're going to keep it real, that's going to get you on a T32 training grant for NIH to move to the F grant, to move, do you understand what I'm saying? To move to the R01, which we know. Black folks are way less likely to get as the sole PI. So I'm going to tell you what people do. What they do is they go get a white Mm co-PI, right? This is the game to get the first R01 because they can't get it by themselves. Not because they're not smart enough, not because they don't work hard enough. Nobody's willing to give it to them. So can you speak on all of those things a little bit too and what that does to people? Yeah. You know, it's funny that you bring this up because I'll never forget Dr. Marcus Lambert who's now the, the Dean of Student Affairs and, and Diversity over at Wild Cornell Medical School, he and I got our PhD out of the same lab, had the same PI. But I specifically had a conversation with him before I committed to going to this lab. And I only asked him one question. I only asked him one question. I was like, yo, do your PIs know that you are Black? And he knew what I meant by that. It wasn't you know, like, oh, you know, like, 
you know, are they aware? It was like, nah, bro, do they 100% know that you are black? He, he gave me so many instances. And one that really sticks out is that he was like, bro, you know, Michael and Susan went to a Kanye West concert. And I was like, bro, for what? He was like, because they like Kanye West, bro. He was like, I was like, oh, okay, all right, tell me more. And he told me so many more instances in which they they not only learned on their own, because, you know, there's a whole bunch of white people who just want to sit down with Black people and then learn from Black people. When Harriet Washington wrote a whole book called Medical Apartheid, you can learn everything you need to know without ever sitting down with any of us, and you can be educated all on your own. Um, but that's a whole nother conversation. But they, they learned on their own. They were willing to learn on their own. And then even when he would talk to them, they were there to not only listen, because some people listen, but they don't, they not learning. They were learning and then implementing. And that was really the game changer for me because I was like, yo, they not allies, they disruptors. That's the kind of people you want in your corner. The yeah. ally wait for something to happen and they like, oh, let me come in and be a savior. Nah, you need some people who are disruptors. They gonna ruffle feathers when you there, when you not there, and they always looking out, you know, for, for moments to make other people grow. So that's that's really that was really the case. But I think you gotta be, you know, Dr. Alfie. I was in a different position when I got to graduate school. I was in the I had been in the military already, so I ain't had a problem with being bold because by that point, and this gonna make sense, I was a grown man, like I was a full grown man with kids. So it was like. I'm gonna have real adult conversations with you about the decisions I'm making. Not the like I'm not timid when I'm walking in the room. I got an agenda. You know what I'm saying? Because we can't play around with this thing. I got kids at home that I need to feed, so we can't play them kind of conversations. But you know, younger folks, they struggling with that because they still dealing with the idea of do I need to assimilate or can I just use what got me here, which is my brilliance, my talent, and everything the way I look when nobody else sees me at the institution who's worried about my appearance. Amen. You know what I'm saying? Like, yes, that's a whole nother, you know, you gotta be able to bring your whole self confidently to the room. Yes. Yes. Because the fragmenting of yourself yeah. leads to some of these mental health issues, right? If you can't be fully who you are, and all the, ain't nobody saying you don't code switch. Like we know that because you code switch with your grandparents, with people you respect, you code switch at church. Right. Not talking about that, but we're talking about when you walk in and you have to think about things like my hair looks like this. I have a beard, right? And that that is going to have, a, my brother used to tell me how he would change the bass in his voice. So he wouldn't scare people, right? And so like, that was how he, one of the ways that he had to function. So when you got to do that, that takes a toll on you, but I love what you're talking about disruptors. Another word for disruptors is sponsors. Mm -hmm. You need a sponsor. You need a person who's going to go in there and kick open that door and bring you in with them and sit you at the table with them and say, y'all going to pay attention to get this person the opportunity. Yeah. And that's what it sounds like those people provided for you at the, at the, in the, I'm sorry, in the lab, the research lab that you went to. So mm -hmm. I, I mean, I'm all for that. So I want people to hear how important showing up as a disruptor or a sponsor is and how meaningful it can be. So let's fast forward to you finished the PhD program and then you, was it always the plan to go to med school and you wanted to do the, how, how did that happen? Nah, so when I was finishing up medical school, right, I realized I knew a lot about prostate cancer. I mean, I knew a ton about prostate cancer. Um, but then if you put a patient in front of me, I couldn't diagnose them with prostate cancer. I didn't know how to deal with their side effects. I didn't know how to deal with some of the sequelae that come with having prostate cancer. I had no understanding of it. And it made me very uneasy. But I also had an epiphany. I had a, a Black man worth epiphany. That's, that's what I always call it. I, I think when I write my book, I'm going to have a whole chapter on Black man worth epiphany. And it was this moment where I came to the realization that I had something to offer. That I, was, that I was a commodity. I was something that people really, really, really needed. And I was capable, internally capable, not externally validatedly capable, internally validatedly capable. I, I had come to the realization that I had accomplished something and that I was proud of, and I didn't need anyone on the outside to tell me that. So I could walk around knowing that. 
So when it came down to me applying to medical school, it was like, I'm not paying to go to medical school. I'm not. There's no way right. you miss me to go into hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. If I know that I've done more than most other people. And I'm black. So I'm a rare, I'm a rare commodity, no matter how you turn it around. I'm a rare commodity. If I would have done all this, I always say if I'd have done all this and I wasn't black, it would be like, oh, that's kind of cool. But I'm black. So I hurdled over systems that you had in place for me not to do this. I did it. I did it with excellence. And now it's time for you to pay me mine. It's time for me to get mine. So, you know, I remember interviewing at some of these schools and them asking me, like, what do we need to do to get you? And I was like, y'all going y'all gonna to pay for me to come in? Y'all ain't going to pay for me to come in? Tell the truth, shame the devil. <laughs> y'all, y'all gonna That's to- it. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all Ask and answer with the Lord. Uh, Amen. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not rolling with it. And so you know, and and then I has, I sat down and had a real honest conversation with my PIs, who you know, and I told them I was like, man, you know, I'm really uneasy about this idea that I don't know anything about treating a patient. And they were like, well, why don't, why don't you go to medical school? Any medical school would take you. It was like every medical school would want to take you. And and even when they told me that. At the time when they told me that, which was about a year before I applied, I was like, like, are y'all just saying this just to gas me or y'all telling me the truth? But I knew it was real when one of my PIs, we had gone to the Howard Hughes Medical Institute um, uh, conference and he pulled me to the side and he was like, listen, if you serious about this medical school thing, he was like, I'll pay for your preparation. He was like, I will pay for your preparation. I'm going to spend them dollars. Wow. And that's when I was like, I was like, oh, he telling the truth. And I called him on it. Because when it was time for me to prepare, I was like, hey, bro, you said you're going to pay for it. It's time. And he was like, all right, let's make it happen. <gasps> and when, when I saw how much money he had dropped on it, I was like, oh, you know, because it's a, it's a whole different ballgame when people start spending cash on you. Oh, yes. You know, especially coming from where we come from, like, because some people could just jive you. But when they tell you the truth, it's a whole different ballgame. So, you know, obviously, I went through the whole medical school process. And I always tell this because it, it gives some credence to this idea that, that, at least for me personally, my belief is God going to put you where you need to be, where you need to be, and, and always how you need to be there. So my daughter, my wife was pregnant with our second daughter. Um. And the day that my second daughter was born was February the 20th, 2018. She was born at 9.43. At 10.30, we were, in, we were still in the recovery room. And um, I got an email from Tulane. And Tulane University has sent me an email letting me know that they had a full ride waiting for me to come to Tulane for medical school. So, so up until this point, literally the only degree I have ever paid for the only one I ever even took out a loan for, and it's only 60,000 total, is um, my MBA that I'm getting right now. That's literally the only degree I've ever paid for. Beautiful. So all these, I think my first five degrees I got for free. Wait a minute, um, this brother just said his first five. Come on now. How many daggone degrees you got? I only counted up three, what, and you're working on four. What's the five? I, I had gotten a master's while I was at NYU too. Ah. Uh. Okay, so you were violent. I'm a violent too. I got my master's at NYU before I yeah. did a doctorate. Ah, yeah. So yeah, so you know that's that's just kind of you know it's, it's dope, but you know it, it really just speaks to this idea that like the you know the, the the worst thing to deal with is somebody from the marginalized community who realize how valuable they are. They the hardest people to deal with. That's it. Because. You ain't going to be able to sit up here and throw no blinders over their eyes. It's not going to work. It doesn't work. So, um, you know, that's that's just where I'm at on that. Oh, my God. That's beautiful. It's like once the blinders come off, once you stand up and realize your worth, it's like gangbusters. Like, it's like crazy. Do you know what I mean? And so what was it for you that made you realize it was the one thing that made you realize your worth? And if so, what was it? I, I think in all honesty, it was, um, if I'm really candid about it, it was when I got Howard Hughes Medical Institute funded. Because I was like, bruh, and not only did I get funded, 
one of my best friends, Philip Thomas, the guy who had come down to go with me to the, the Whitney Plantation, he got funded. So you really couldn't tell his name because we was in the same lab. We both came from HBCUs and we was Howard Hughes Medical Institute funded and we was Ford Foundation funded and we was NIH funded. It was like, you couldn't tell us nothing. You couldn't tell us absolutely nothing. And, you know, in, in that moment, I remember him and I sitting down in the lab and just, there's a song by Kurt Franklin called Silver and Gold. Um, you know, and we love listening to that song all the time. But in, in the moment, he looked at me and I looked at him and he was like, hey, bruh, we just, we it. We it, bruh. Like, we it. And it was just a celebration between the two of us, you know, it wasn't nice. something that we went to go tell the world about. I and, mean, you know, in hindsight, obviously, I could talk to I could talk about it, but we walked around having conversations. You know, another thing that really speaks to my mental health, even when I was in my PhD was. This and you gonna understand this, we can have conversations about science in our language. You know what I'm saying? Amen. Like, Amen. We had conversations. I was like, nah, bro. Like, you remember how J. Cole said this? That's basically what this protein doing. And he's yes. like, yeah, 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 yeah. But what if it turned up like this? And, and the fact that, that the two of us could sit down and have a conversation about science in our vernacular, and it was still brilliant. It was probably more brilliant for the fact that we could translate it. Yes. You know, to our language. Yes. We, you know, it was like, bro, we could talk about science at the highest level in our own language. Like, amen. Who else can do that? Like, <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> right. It's that abstract reasoning because you're taking this concrete thing here and this concrete thing here and you're blending them together and you're creating something new. Yeah. Right. And that kids, our young people need to see. I mean, you're young, but our young, younger people need to see that who you are and the fullness of who you are, there is a space for you in this thing called science, in this thing called medicine, in this thing called medical school or graduate school or any professional school, because there's they don't have a lock on brilliance, these other people out here. No. You are just as brilliant, right? And so I love, I love what you're saying and I, I just think it's beautiful. So where's your friend now? The friend that, are you? is he in medical school too? Nah, so he ended up getting a postdoctoral position at Regeneron um, Pharmaceuticals, which is in upstate New York. Um, you know, and obviously he and I talk every week and we actually get ready to build a company now that specifically speaks to black mental health and black in, in black men. Um, that's and it, it comes out of that nature paper that I wrote uh, called Bootless. Um, and basically, wait, tell us about that. Tell us about Bootless. You guys, you got to big that up. Turn up. Come on, yeah. give it to us. <laughs> so Bootless came in. Uh, I remember getting a call. Um, from Katarina Petrinsky, who's the, she's the chief editor of Nature Genetics. Um, and she's, her, her husband is my mentor. He's like a big brother to me, a Russian dude, um, who is a very unlikely friend, um, but a very strong disruptor and sponsor, somebody like that. And um, she asked me to write a piece on the, the navigation of an unadulteratedly black man in medicine and science. She said, like, you could write it and be as, she said, I'm not gonna edit it. I'm not gonna touch it. And she had gotten approval from like the people. So I was like, I'm not sure you actually want this, um, but if you're willing to really sign off on it and, and get it in the cycle, then and I'll go ahead and write it. And you know, it actually took me two months before I wrote the first word because I knew writing that was going to be very painful. Like it was going to be painful to tell honesty in such a way that I would be so vulnerable. And not only that, but like, it was going to be out there forever. So like when it came down for residency, somebody like, bro, you can't be this honest. And like, what if we got institutional issues? You might tell some of my institutional issues, you know? So, so I knew that it came with a cost, but I was like, this is a cost I'm willing to take up. So, uh, obviously, Martin Luther King made a comment in, 19, in the 1960s about the idea of being bootless, right? He, he essentially said that it was a cruel jest to tell a man um, that had no boots to pull themselves up by the bootstraps. Um, you know, and, and essentially this idea of being bootless um, was my way of saying that I've accomplished all these amazing things, 
yet somehow I'm perceived as incapable. Um, somehow, like, I don't know how, but it happens. Like, you know, I, I, I made a comment that, you know, I know where these seeds of subtle hatred for my culture and identity being visible come from. The ones that grew into trees, the one, the trees that sway back and forth, you know, that, that cover my brilliance. And, and you know, and, and basically the whole idea was, is that I've done all this and I'm still, I'm still Buddhist. Like how, how is that still possible? So. So was, is the idea of bootless is, is the, is it that we are bootless as black people or that we're perceived as bootless or is it both? It's a little bit of both, but, I, but I would, but I would definitely, it, I, I wrote it from the lens of the majority reading it. And so if you see it from my perspective, it's like, bro, when you see me, you got to understand that I'm pulling myself up without any boots on. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's Period. no way I can validate myself. There's nothing. I, I've done everything that I've done everything that you did. Right. I did everything that you did. And it's Amen. still not enough. Amen. And, and, and some. And so, like, that, that's really the idea. And, you know, obviously people can can Google it and read about it. Um, Bootless, it's on Nature's website. Um, but, you know, that paper obviously was trending number one in the world at one point. And, it, it came with a lot of notoriety, but it also came with a lot of pain. I remember the first words I wrote for that paper. Um, I woke up at four o'clock in the morning, um, on, in maybe like early, early September of 2020. And I was up in the morning writing um, and I wrote those first words and I just couldn't get maybe 10 words in before I was sobbing. I wasn't crying, I was sobbing and I woke my wife up. Um, and so she she walked um, up to the desk and she was just like, what's wrong? And, um, you know, I, I just told her, I was like, it just feels like no matter what do I, what I accomplish, somehow I'm still going to be viewed as incapable. And she was like, you know, she was like, to some degree, that's true. She was like, that's true. She was like, but also you need to leave that on the paper. She's like, not only do you need to write it, but you need to leave it there and don't don't keep it with you. That's somebody else's brother in the carry, not yours. And so that's that's really where, you know, you know, shout out, shout, shout out to the winning wilds out here who who just like really, you know, they, yes. I think, you know, I, I think I, I can specifically speak for my own. She just knows how to pour into me what I need when I need it. And then I'm in that moment, I needed somebody to just reposition me mentally you know, in, in, in what I needed. And, and a lot of my mental health just comes from sharing my vulnerabilities with her, knowing that like, it doesn't evaluate me as a person. That's right. It's just how I'm coping with the world and I'm living in, you know? So that's, that's, that's really where it is with Bootless. Yeah, Bootless, uh, Bootless took a lot out of me. <laughs> Somebody else asked me to write something after that. I was like, no, nah, I'm not interested. Amen. <laughs> I ain't got nothing left in me right now. That's right. Oh my God. Well, I'll tell you what I love about all of it. I love what your wife said about put it on the paper and leave it on the paper. I love what she said about, give me one second. So I have to switch to without my mic. I love what she said about leave it on the paper. I love that you're being so honest about what it took out of you and the vulnerability that you had to live in. You had to exist in that vulnerability to get through the writing. And I don't, and I hope people will go back to the beginning of this conversation where we talked about what it means to be in these systems and what it means for us as people, black people, to deal with what we deal with when we're in these structures. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that people, I don't know if anybody could really fully understand. They need to read Bootless from nature to fully to, to get a sense of it. But I don't know that they could ever really know. And so I think. The, the one piece that still upsets me is that there are still people out there who will say, but if you write this, you are outing these systems that have caused the trauma. And my thing is, why shouldn't they be outed? Because they out here, not only for you, that's the same kind of trauma I experienced. It's the same kind of trauma. People are in these settings right now. Is some, a young brother named Christopher Veal. He's a third year medical student up at somewhere in Vermont. I think it might, I'm not sure what the name of the medical school is, but he just wrote something that came out two, three days ago about, he's black man, black gay man, about suicide, mental health, mm. and black men, black folks in medicine. 
You understand me? So what you're saying, there's this thread, right? And it's systemic. And so it just makes me sad yeah. that there are people around you who would say, or around me or around any of us who would say, yeah, but if you tell that, if you tell the truth, yeah, we ain't making it up that somehow <laughs> you got to worry about what people, who cares what they think? They did it. Do you know what I mean? Like they caused the problem. There's a system in place that is not supporting people. So I'm just so deeply appreciative of your bravery, of your honesty, of your respect for culture, of your respect for the history, right? For the ancestors, because had they not done what they did, you and I wouldn't be able to do what we do. Um, and your children and my children, if we don't do what we do, they wouldn't be able to see. So those girls of yours, they're gonna see the fullness of what a black man is. They're gonna see a black man with his natural kinky hair. They're gonna see a black man who's a big guy who inhabits his, his body and his physicality. They're gonna see a black man with a beard. And on top of all of that, they're gonna see that man working in settings where you look like you look. And they say, Paige and Dr. Lede, and my man gonna come bouncing down the hall with his J. Cole in his ear, or you know, some, some old school tribe called Quest or something. May I help you? You understand me? That's important. Yeah. That is like, yeah. that's beautiful. So just congratulations to you. I would love for you to tell the people about all the projects that you want them to hear about. So the White Coats Project, they need to hear Bootless Again in Nature, the company, anything that you want to tell us and where they can follow you. Because I already follow you on Instagram, but where can people follow you and learn more about all this wonderful work that you're doing? Yeah, so you could definitely follow the 15 White Coats. Literally is the one five White Coats on Instagram, Facebook, uh, Twitter. You can follow me on Instagram at Dr. Russell Liday. It's just DR and then my name. Um, and then the bootless article, literally you can just Google my name and bootless um, and you'll find it. Or you could just use the link tree in my, my Instagram profile. And then as far as the 15 white coats, if you want to support it, you could visit the 15 whitecoats.org and figure out how you can support it. Um, and then obviously once the company comes out, I'll, I'll release it on our uh on our instagram and everywhere else uh thank you so much for having me on here dr alfie uh it's it's amazing to uh to be here i remember the invite and saying to myself like i remember telling my manager like yo like one of my idols invited me on her <laughs> <laughs> but this is a big deal <laughs> I was like, oh, it's a big deal you know, because because obviously even going back to before Dr. Oz, like I've been rocking um, with Kalston Color and just like the whole the whole vibe on your Instagram page for a minute because it was helpful. You know, I'm obviously a military veteran and, I, and I've had so many different moments of, of, of mental health instability and just like having to navigate it um, from, you know, from obviously from deployments and then medical school is trauma and sometimes even raising kids. Yes. Moments of trauma. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's tough. And so like you have all these moments and you look for moments to inspire you or to build you up or to secure you or affirm you. And, and you could definitely find that on, on, on your web, you know, on your Instagram file. So, you know, I, I definitely look forward to a lot of the posts that you put up um and they just know that they helping they helping me you know so i appreciate you having me on here of course thank you so much dr lede and i'm gonna say in closing good luck to you and why well, anyone say good luck i'm gonna say keep rising because y'all already right you and those babies and your wife and like all the people in your circle your friend who's doing his postdoc is it regeneron is that what you said yeah, he's at regeneron he's at regeneron Le Keep, keep rising, brother. And I'm just looking forward to watching this star continue to rise and continue to shine like my pillow says back there, rising and thriving. That's what you're going to keep doing. And just thank you so much for being open and spending time with me today. No problem at all. Thank you so much, Dr. Alfie. So there you have it. That's a wrap for another episode of Couched in Color. We want you to know that we deeply value you, all of our viewers and our listeners, and everyone out there working to support optimal mental health, both for themselves and for our young people. And one of the best ways you can help our movement is by leaving us a five-star review on our YouTube channel and everywhere you enjoy your audio podcasts, and by sharing our podcast with a friend. Please also tag us while you're out there listening 
and watching. Finally, head on over to dralfie.com for more information about me, www.acomaproject.org for information about my nonprofit. And those are the places you can go to learn more about how you can help. So I'll see you next week. And until then, I'm going to say what I always say, which is that I'm wishing you lots of love, lots of light, and that I'm hoping it is always, always informed by good, culturally relevant science. Take care.